Um, I just wanted to say thanks to uh, Richard for inviting me here today. I'm uh, pretty excited to talk about the programming that I've been doing at the National Gallery. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell you a bit about, uh, for me, one of the most uh, exciting uh, parts of my life so far. I'm 35 years old and this has really been something that has uh, brought a lot of um, excitement for me because of all of the meaning behind educating people on the social, political, cultural issues uh, that uh, involve Indigenous people but through art and for me that's just like a, a, an amazing, um, it's, it's, it's an amazing uh, event that, that happened so far. It was uh, the Sakahan International Indigenous Art was from May 16th and it lasted until September 2nd. Uh, that was this year. So, if, if, how many people got to, to go to it? You're very lucky because um, this is the first of its kind in the world. This is actually groundbreaking and historic and has never happened anywhere. So if you did get to see this, consider yourself really lucky. If you got to see it more than once, even, even better because the content in this exhibition was so rich. Uh, that even as an employee who, who, who took kids and, and adults around and talked about each of the pieces, I still feel like I didn't get to soak up every, uh, you know, meaning and piece uh, that, that was in the exhibition itself. There was 82 Indigenous artists and they were from uh, 16 countries from around the world. Um, 188 pieces in this one exhibition. It was so expansive that it went even to New Zealand. Uh, it also happened uh, in uh, Vancouver at the Grant Gallery, uh, the Urban Shaman in Winnipeg, in the market. Uh, there was a, a gallery in Windsor, uh, the Ontario, or the Ottawa Art Gallery, Saw Gallery, Gallery 101. It, it was huge and people were really on board with sending this message kind of at the same time like this huge education blast on indigenous social and political cultural issues at the same time. So you can uh, change the next slide. This is uh, some of the kind of the gallery's uh, happenings in the past. So I've been an employee there since about February just learning about what was, what was the involvement prior to Sakahan International Indigenous <coughs> Art. Luckily the program was funded privately. Had there not been a private funder none of this programming would have existed. So that's not to say that the exhibition itself wouldn't have existed, it very much would have, but the amount of energy that went into educating the public was, uh, was so huge and it was because of this private donation. So uh, in the past, um, these are some of the uh, involvement, this is some of the involvement that the gallery has had. It's uh, started uh, mostly with uh, Inuit, of course, in 1952, they were still uh, using the word Eskimo, Eskimo sculpture. Um, and by 2005, they have Inuit sculpture now. So the, the um, solo uh, exhibitions on the left-hand side, uh, some of the more uh, contemporary ones, of course, Norval Morisot, Daphne Ojig, and Carl Beam. But with the, it was really, they had some, uh, you know, Inuit people at the opening in 1984. Nine, I think, at the new gallery where, where it is now. Um, but in terms of how expansive the outreach was to Indigenous people, to the Aboriginal community, nothing's ever been uh, uh, done like it before. So for the educational program, we had youth tours, Our Ways, Our Stories, Sakahan Youth Ambassador Program, Junior Curator Program, Apprenticeship, and we also did a video. The other side was with the Ottawa Aboriginal Coalition, who received an equal donation. Well, I should say, I don't know if it was equal, but it was uh, a donation to do similar things, and that's some of the programming that they did, and we did these in partnership. So the Ottawa Aboriginal Coalition is an organization uh, that consists of several local um, uh, leaders from the organizations here in, in Ottawa. And uh, this was also a partnership with the United Way. So the first uh, art piece I want to start off with is really fitting and I try to start off uh, with this piece because it's called Blanket Stories and it's by a Seneca artist whose name is Marie Watt. And uh, I don't know if anybody submitted a blanket. Did anybody actually get, yay, we have one person who submitted a blanket. So there was a call out for people to actually participate in this piece. 
So what Marie wanted to do was to kind of uh, touch on the topic of trade. So when a person submitted a blanket, uh, she would give back a uh, poster uh, in exchange. And so this also goes back to during the Hudson Bay and uh, very much Métis people are built off trading and, and inter interchanging uh, uh, things between nations. And so in this uh, blanket, one very important story um, is about the Hudson Bay blanket itself. And uh, when I take people around, they're often really surprised. Uh, some people think they've heard the story before. Some people haven't heard it in this way before. But um, there's also some other, I'll tell you, I'll get to that story in a second, but there's also some stories in there, you know, everybody has a blanket, everybody has a story in their blanket, whether they received one uh, as a wedding gift, whether they received one, uh, you know, you came home in one as a baby. Uh, one woman thought that babies actually came from blankets, because every time her mom came home from the hospital, it was wrapped in a blanket, and her dad said, you know, we have another blanket here. So there's... Um, the Hudson Bay blanket is about uh, three or four of them, I believe. There's one kind of in the middle, closer to the top. There's one right at the very top. So obviously, it's a significant blanket in the history of Aboriginal people, of Indigenous people in Canada. So a lot of us know that many Indigenous people died from smallpox or tuberculosis, uh, a virus which was uh, concealed in these blankets. But what we didn't know until recently, Robert Houle, who is an Indigenous artist, did some of his own research into the Hudson Bay Blanket. And what he discovered was, and it took, in my opinion, an Indigenous artist to figure this out and to, uh, to bring it to light, that he, he discovered that there were generals of armies who were actually taking the blanket and cutting it up into little squares, putting those little squares of infected blankets into silver boxes and giving them to our indigenous leaders who would then uh, take those back to the community. So it was an on-purpose attempt at, bi at biological warfare into uh, uh, killing uh, indigenous people. So uh, this, of course, is a very important story. The, the blanket is in other... Uh, art pieces in the exhibition. We'll see another one. So that was just another view of the blanket. This is uh, Sunny Asu, and he's arranging a piece called 1884 to 1951. And I had the pleasure of, uh, while he's arranging, uh, chatting with him um, about his piece a little bit. And you can see as well on the ground, he also uses a Hudson Bay blanket in his piece. And that's to talk about or build upon what this art piece really is. So there's uh, 67 copper cups, which represent the 67 years in between 1884 and 1951. And in between those years, that's uh, how long the potlatch was banned for Kwakwakwiak people, which he is of heritage. And uh, during that time, if you were caught celebrating the potlatch, you could um, either go to jail, you would receive a $200, uh, 200 fine, and or they would take your stuff, which I affectionately tell people that you can go and see it now at the Canadian Museum of Civilization. And if you're Aboriginal, you can see it for free. So it's a good thing they have it. Um, here he arranges the cups differently every time. And so on the front, uh, when by the time he was done with it, and I think if you, if you go to the next slide, you can see how the final arrangement is made here. Um, he has four cups at the front. He has uh, a disarray of these Starbucks cups, which I tried to hide mine and uh, I couldn't. But it's to talk about, um, you know, this sort of wasteful society, how we can go to Starbucks and we can grab a coffee or a latte or a tea for three, four, five dollars, and that is holding a sign of wealth in our hands. It may only be three or four dollars, but it's still a sign of wealth, and what we do with it after is we check it. And so we have this sort of disarray of, of cups to represent the idea that there's this wasteful society, yet the pot latch was intended to try, try to keep people on an equal basis by uh, having, um, giving away items so that uh, people would um, not go without reusing items. The copper, for instance, which was a shield about this <coughs> high, sometimes it was, it was really high. The shield, the copper shield, gained in value every time it was given to another person. And so again, that's unlike our, our, our wasteful uh, Starbucks cups. The four cups at the very top represents uh, an, an honoring to the four uh, uh, founders of the Idle No More movement. Um, 
Now, in the back is a really important piece. Uh, I mean, they all really are, but this whole room, if you had the chance to walk into it, is super powerful. You go in it and you can actually visualize this policy called the Indian Act and how uh, it has, uh, and, and I get that sort of feeling about how it, it has affected many Indigenous people's lives. Um, I had a group, uh, I had a group of, of people who came into the gallery, they uh, were for sure native and I went out to, they looked pretty lost and out of place. So I went and I said, hey, are you guys Aboriginal? And I think only another Aboriginal person might be able to say that, which was uh, how we got to ch talking about um, me having some free time and them being lost and from uh, the East Coast and uh, being able to give them a tour. They just happened to be teachers who brought some uh, 19, 18, 20 year old youth with them uh, to Ottawa and they had heard about this exhibition. And so it was just sort of like this uh, moment built in the stars waiting to happen for us to go and walk around. And when they got into this room, two of the teachers nearly started crying. They felt the power of this policy that has ruled their lives. and. Uh, looking, uh, if you did get a chance, this is a, uh, it is a piece called The Indian Act by Nadia Mir, and she's Algonquin, the only Algonquin indigenous artist in the whole show, and she's from Kitagon Zibi. And she would, uh, there, it's, you can't see it, but there's a whole wall on this side, and it's uh, red names, names in red writing, and all of those are people who contributed to this piece by beating uh, red beads onto the white paper of a, each page of The Indian Act and then uh, beating the words uh, with white beads. And if you think about what that means, you know, looking at the Indian Act, which is a white, you know, pieces of paper, piece of paper, black words, what she's doing is she's showing you the Indian Act for what it really is. This is not an Indian Act necessarily uh, built for white people, it's for red people, and so we're gonna bring that out and show you really who is it for. And then the black words are beaded white to show you that those words are not created by black people or they're created by, by white people. And that really sort of is uh, kind of shocking when you think of, you know, the boldness of, of beating the Indian Act in that sort of way as a form of resistance to it. So this is uh, Richard Bell, and he is a um, indigenous artist from Australia. Uh, he calls this piece Life on a Mission. It's a huge piece. I am not a noble savage. And um, it's a little bit hard to see probably from where you are, but there's things in the back, denial, um, collective, evolving. So there's sort of words that are uh, uh, genocide. There's words in the background. Um, but what you have at the forefront, of course, is this idea of uh, indigenous people as being a noble savage. So um, where, you know, I, I can go on a whole lot about this one, but I won't, um, because uh, what I mostly wanted to say is that the sort of, something that we've been, uh, uh, I, I, that we've been thinking about is this idea of a, uh, a collective um, amnesia of history, right? And so, uh, in this sense, um, being able to, uh, I, I talk about, there's a, there's a movie called Rango, Ringo, or something like that. Yeah, has anybody seen it? I I spent a lot of money on this movie to take my kids to go and see it. I have three kids, uh, twins that are just about twelve, and a son who's ten. I, and when we got to one of the parts, it, it, it was a really touching movie for the most part until we got to the part where uh, one of the animals uh, points to the crow and who is obviously dressed up and, and has an accent as a Native American and uh, he's, you know, praying to the spirits, to the ancestors. And I, I, this is like in 2011, by the way, 12 or something. It's not that long ago. And uh, he ends up insulting this raven, calling him a, um, a dong dang dumb Indian or something like that. And here I have my uh, children in the theater. And so we, we look at this idea of stereotypes uh, of this noble savage, uh, you know, all kinds of, um, even the issue that we're, we're looking at now with the Redskins, uh, in terms of uh, what does that, you know, word mean. Uh, my son, who is, I'm Métis, my son uh, is Métis and his dad's Mohawk, so he's got both of those heritage as a, as a little football player who plays against the Redskins 
and wants to kick the sign every time he plays, this does have an effect on people. And so this idea, again, of the noble savage and, uh, is something that we, um, we think about in terms of educating kids about their identity. Nicotine by Brian Jungin. Uh I love this piece because um, it's this sort of strange idea of beautiful beadwork against plastic uh, ready-made, you know, gas can. And uh, Brian Jungin, it's, it, it was positioned really uh, closely to Christy Belcourt's piece, which is uh, kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's modeled, I guess, in a way after, inspired by Métis beadwork. And so Brian Youngin, who beadwork is also a part of his culture, he decided he wanted to try beadwork. And he really wasn't very good at it, but he knew he was good at drilling holes and things. So this is how you get the uh, uh, tobacco plant, tobacco flowers in the gas can. And so he's taken, of course, the most poisonous, one of the most poisonous plants in nature, and he puts it on a gas can to try to make that link between uh, what uh, the oil and gas uh, extraction or industry is doing to uh, indigenous cultures. And so uh, when I had a, another student, probably in his 50s, come through the gallery, he reminded me that the word for gas, uh, which is uh, close to the word pimote, uh, which means walk, means the same thing. So gas and, and walk are the same word in, our, in, a, in the Cree language. And then it made me think about this idea of movement and the cost of progress or movement, you know, in, in society and this and, and the oil and gas industry and spe uh, specifically and the harm on, on culture and, and the environment. Uh, handcuffs, uh, Jamesy uh, Pudlopitsiolak, uh, who's from Baker Lake, uh, was uh, this piece I just I find amazing. What you can't see on it, unfortunately, unless you were there to kind of look around the whole um, sculpture is that there's actually a lock. So if the key was able to be uh, picked up, there actually is a lock that can unlock those chains. But there's this idea of whether or not, you know, one of those hands is going to be able to pick up the key. And um, the idea of, of uh, justice or, or social justice or, or even literally of, of being in the jail system itself um, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of times, uh, basically, people's hands are tied in terms of what kind of uh, progress can be made. Um, it's, it's a significant piece in so many ways. That's just sort of how I uh, interpret it. This uh, piece by Rebecca Belmore is called Fringe. Uh, it's a huge uh, piece that's uh, actually a, a light box piece and was uh, also um, in Montreal on a, on a billboard. And I, I think we should have more billboards like this than some of the billboards we see out there. But um, the idea here is that uh, the uh, artist, Anishinaabe artist, uh, you know, when you, come, when you come close to this piece, it's really quite shocking. And so um, I ask people to take a few minutes uh, to think about some of uh, not only the first words that pop up into your head, but also the feelings that you get when you see this. Especially, I'm assuming most of you are aware of the issues of uh, over 600 missing and murdered Indigenous women. And so well, I know when I look at this piece, it's very much one of the first things that I see. And you uh, can witness this huge gash across her back. And it's hard for us to take our eyes off of this woman's back because this gash is so large. And what makes it easier for us to keep our eyes on her is that she isn't looking at us. If she was looking at us, it might be harder to take a look at this, this image. But she's letting us look at her back. In fact, it's almost, uh, in a way, uh, sh an invitation in the sense that she wants us to see this wound, the scar on her back. The other thing that is really interesting for me is that she isn't in pain. She isn't scrunched up, you know, kind of what you would think it would look like to be in pain. She actually looks quite peaceful. It looks almost like she can get up off of the bed and just walk away with that huge scar on her back. And this, uh, in a sense, uh, in, a, in a huge way, I think the artists wanted to get across the idea that you can have something that is both grotesque but something that is very beautiful at the same time, just like the scar 
that she bears as an indigenous woman of the over 600 missing and murdered indigenous women. But she didn't put that scar there, but she bears it. So that's just something to think about. I also uh, like to, when I talk about education through the arts, uh, at the age of 15 years old was when I first uh, was able to go and, and see contemporary indigenous art. I'm from a really tiny town of 3,000 people. Um, and when I first saw uh, Reservation X at the Canadian Museum of Civilization, it was the first time that I had learned about residential schools, which I would later find out that my father, who is Métis, went to a, a mission school. And so I was able to find out, uh, first of all, that these schools ex existed, and then to connect that with my own history and past uh, through my father, and understanding that this, in fact, does affect me as an intergenerational survivor. With uh, digging a little bit deeper into uh, that issue, realizing the reason he was at the residential school was because when his mother, my grandmother, was murdered at the age of 34, he was sent into foster care. And while he was in foster care, he was sent to this mission school as well. So there's this huge history of institutionalism in my father's life who spent many years after uh, in, in the jail system as well. And so when I look at this piece automatically as an indigenous person, I get these links. And when I'm bringing little kids through there, I want them to get some of the links too. I mean, some of these are really big, heavy issues, but they know them. It's not like they come up to this piece and don't have a connection to something like this at the age of 11 or 10 years old. They do. They're out there protesting on Parliament Hill with their mothers whose sisters are missing or their grandmother who has been murdered. They know these issues. So to be able to see themselves represented in a national institution is, is really a big deal. And at first when I was taking these young people through, uh, I think after the third time there was a little bit of, you know, we're, we're, we're obviously there, some, of the, some of the kids are, are, are a little, um, you know, they're different uh, ba cultural backgrounds, indigenous cultural backgrounds, different economic backgrounds, different age ranges from uh, eight years old. Uh, I, think, I think for these programs, I, 13 was, was sort of our cap. And uh, when I had taken them through Sakahan like three times, I said, okay, there's got to be something else because they're going to think this is normal, that indigenous art is just at the National Gallery all the time. So I took them into the Canadian side, the Canadian galleries, where they have this tiny little room that has about five or six pieces of Indigenous art that was actually considered artifact that they borrowed from the Canadian Museum of Civilization. You know, uh, sort of um, an interesting way to look at art versus artifact. So to, to educate, you know, uh, the, this, to educate the young people that normally this is what's here. And if you go a little bit even further back, you'll see that the art of indigenous people is not done by indigenous people. We have uh, a lot of artists who uh, are uh, painting indigenous scenes uh, or, and then going you know, even up to, to Emily Carr and beyond. So that's sort of a reality until you get to like Alex Janvier and Daphne Ojeg. Um, uh, and then, and that's sort of the reality. So when they went from one side of the gallery to the other side of the gallery, I think it really uh, was a, a poignant point for them that, okay, this is really special. Because when that exhibition is gone, which it is now, it's a little sparse in the indigenous art aspect of. <laughs> so uh, this piece uh, is a really powerful piece in the sense of uh, Teresa Margolis, uh, this piece is called Tala Bordada, and it's, um, I put it here because I wanted to uh, make that connection between Rebecca Belmore's piece Fringe and this one. It's a powerful piece in the sense that uh, it's sometimes not what you expect, but it has the same idea of this sort of grotesque and beauty happening and existing at the same time. She is from Guatemala and uh, wanted to raise the issue again of uh, missing and murdered indigenous women in her country. What she was able to do was acquire a sheet that had the bloodstains of a woman who was murdered in Guatemala. And she took that sheet and uh, brought it to a group of community women who took some time to embroider some of their uh, indigenous symbols onto the sheet to not only raise awareness of missing and murdered indigenous women, but also to honor this woman's life and to heal. 
there's a lot of people who miss the women that are gone, who understand that these women matter. And to think that it doesn't matter what country you go to, whether you're in Norway or France or Africa or Australia or New Zealand or Canada or United States, indigenous women have the highest numbers of missing and murdered people any country you go to in the world. These are some of the camp counselors and the youth. Uh, this is a piece by Vernon McKee. Um, I'll just move on because I think I'm at my limit. Am I pretty close? I'm getting pretty close. Uh, this is the back of um, Cant Chant, uh, which, uh, yeah, there's so much. I, I, there's books written on each one of these pieces sometimes, in some cases. So we'll go on to the next one. This is, um, this is a bit of uh, what I do at the gallery, giving people tours. And the piece that is in the background is uh, Power in Darkness by Danny Meller. And I just really like this piece because it gives people an idea of the stuff that's missing that they don't even really notice. So has anybody ever used or saw Blue Willow China? I know we had it when I was a kid. We had this kind of brown willow pattern China where we had sort of the prairie <coughs> scene on the back and uh, in, 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 this, in this plate. And so uh, behind me is, the, is, is a, a, a triptych, I believe that it's called, a, um, in, the, in the background where uh, Danny Miller hand draws this beautiful sort of blue willow pattern on each of these, uh, inside each of these frames. But um, you, you can't quite see it because I'm standing in front of it there. But um, just right around here and here and a little bit all over in the trees there's indigenous people and they're actually in color yay they're in color they're not sort of melting they're there first of all um, <laughs> lots of <laughs> people um, there's a sort of idea as well that um, you know to draw these landscapes kind of enforces the idea of and I know I know that you all know this term terra nullius you know nothing existed on this earth and so we have an artist who comes in and starts drying up and whipping up all these landscapes and they're missing things like the indigenous people and the animals that exist there before they got there. So we also see that in Kent Monkman's piece where uh, there's things missing in these beautiful landscapes that were um, being painted by European artists when they came to North America, missing the stories. So he puts the stories back in there of two-spirited people. He puts the stories back in those paintings of the little people and of uh, issues like um, uh, Picasso's in there being held up by a black man. And a lot of people understand that his uh, influences of, in his art, which he became very famous for, came from uh, the masks of uh, African indigenous people. So. Um, that's uh, sort of this idea of things that are, are left out, and if they're not there, we might not notice it. And it takes somebody like Danny Meller and Kent Monkman to put them in to say, hey, hey, there's something missing here. So that's, that's about it. Uh, it's Jenny Clark, and I have worked with Richard now for the last eight years, co-hosting the conference, the Human Trafficking Conference, that coincides with the art exhibits and the permanent collection we have. My, pre my um, presentation takes us off towards India. Um, I'm basically, this is a work in progress. Um, the ideas have stemmed from many different aspects of my work in India. Um, but basically, it's um, a camera project of camera and children. Um, I know it's been done before, this whole concept of empowering children through um, cameras. Um, there was a documentary made years ago that was called Born into Brothels. Um, the offshoot of that was a camera and kids project that educated and empowered sex workers children. Um, but this project, um, it's basically a co-production, well a project that um, is at the moment we've just obtained NGO status in India. Um, there are two of us working together. There's a photographer from India, his work is being exhibited outside, um, and then myself. Um, it's called Tarang. Can we move on to the next two slides, actually? And the next one. Um, and basically, it started off in Varanasi in India. Um, there are, in terms of India, in terms of child labor, um, there's different aspects. Of course, there's bonded labor, there's children who are trafficked, etc. These are none of this. Um, these are children who have homes. 
Um, they live close by the Varanasi, but the of sort of fairly poor socioeconomic background. And the, the work is more informal in the sense of the parents don't have enough money to survive. And so basically what they do is they sell this thing that's called arty, uh, which are these like flower floats to tourists um, who then place them on the river Ganges and then basically make wishes and good fortunes and so forth. Um, and basically this project emerged from me sitting there with my camera and watching these kids and watching these kids run around. They're very um, industrious and clever in the sense of they can manipulate tourists to get more money, etc. and things, and they're small children. Um, but basically I would watch how often tourists eventually get sick of children coming up to them and asking them for money and, and things and stuff. And I'd watch these kids be sort of pushed aside by tourists and watch their faces as they got really sad and went and sat down on the side. Um, and I started to think about what that does to their self-esteem. And so hence, that's where this idea came from. The idea came from the children themselves, because basically I was sitting there watching them with my camera, um, and one of them came up and said, started looking at my camera and playing with it. I gave it to her, and off she ran and took photographs. Actually, I think she filled up my memory card with about 100 photographs in about five minutes. Um, and I thought, OK, I need to delete all these photographs. But then I started to look at the photographs before I deleted them all. And I started to see, and this is where sort of I think um, like art, or in this case, photography, can be used in various creative ways because I started to look at the photographs. And I, so I started to look at the photographs that she was taking or what interested her as a child um, to what I was taking. And they were very different. Um, and also, I saw to see how it, it gave her self-esteem because people saw, saw her differently. So there's this little kid out there with a camera. Actually, you can move to the next one because that's one of the girls I'm talking about. Um, that's just um, a logo of our um, project, basically. but the and yeah, and the next one, sorry. Um, this is a little girl in question. Her name is Priya. Um, and so basically, um, it wasn't so much just the photographs that she was taking. It was the, the self-esteem she started to develop because all of a sudden, tourists and everybody saw her differently because there she was with this camera around her neck. And then at the same time, I started to look at the people who she was taking photographs of because the people she was taking photographs of reacted completely differently than if I was taking the photograph, right? And so I started to look at all of these things that, that were taking place and how we could utilize them, basically. Um, and so one, we created this sort of NGO. Um, we're still in the early stages. Um, we don't have cameras. We use our own cameras and we give them to the children. As I say, they have homes. And so we have gone and met with the, ch the, the children's parents, told them about our project. Um, a lot of these children don't go to school. Um, because they have to come out and then they have to sell this arty and things. Um, but basically, then I also started to wonder how I could utilize this in my own research. And so basically, my research is on gender equality and gender differences in India. And so then I started to wonder if we use children, um, in other words, if we used a girl age six and then a boy age six, a girl age 10 and a boy age 10, and we, we gave them the cameras. And we just had them document the everyday lives and, and examine the photographs. Because again, when you examine photographs, they can be examined from many different ways. First of all, there's what the person taking the photograph was intending you to see. There's what you then see from the photograph, et cetera. And so basically, the project has now evolved into working with an NGO in Varanasi that deals with gender empowerment mostly and also child poverty. And so basically what we're doing is I'm exploring gender differences through the eyes of the children and through the camera. And so what they, they go off and they're going to take, this is I actually in the process, so we're just now giving them the cameras. And so they're going to go off and document their daily lives over about two month period and these different age levels. And then from there, we're going to sort of sit down with the children, talk to them about why did you take this photograph? What does this photograph mean to you? Um, and then from there, look to see where we can begin to see um, in a much more informal way where these gender distinctions and differences start to emerge through children. 
Um, and so basically that is where we are with the project and actually all I put together was a series of slides of the children in the project basically that we can sort of go through. Um, this is Priya um, uh, two years ago, at the start of her work, the next one. This is Priya this year. Um, in terms of the education for the children with their cameras, um, because we still don't have funding for our project and we're using our own cameras, um, and which we've actually gone through two cameras accidentally, um, and that sort of goes back to the, the children taking photographs compared to adults. My colleague um, had a very nice camera, Canon uh, $3,000 camera, and we were, he was along, sitting along the Ghats by the Ganges, and he just took a photograph of um, a religious person that's called a Naga Sadhu, um, that the children had taken pictures of. The children had taken pictures of the same person, and he had been happy, let them take the picture. My friend, the, the, my photographer, took the, the photograph, and the Naga Sadhu grabbed his camera before he could even grab it back, and just threw it on the floor and smashed it. Um, so that was one camera down, and then a couple of weeks later, I lent him one of my cameras that the children were using, and then basically um, another boat hit his boat, and he fell into the River Ganges, and so that was camera number two. <laughs> and so we're still learning, and I think the children sort of look at us as, yes, they're still learning too. Um, so we have a nice relationship going with the children and us. But this is a film camera, basically. And so we're teaching the children different skills. So we're teaching them di digital photography, but we're also teaching them sort of film, uh, film camera skills. Um, and her face here is, um, she was handed the camera, and I said, you have to focus it. She went off and sort of focused it, took her picture. But then that's when she turned to look at the image. And of course, there was no image. <laughs> and hence her expression of where's my image. Um, but we're teaching them um, all the different sort of camera skills and things basically. Um, uh, and then finally that's us working together with the children. And so basically um, that, that's what my project is and what my presentation today is. It's is just sort of the way you can utilize a camera in so many different ways and, and sort of and how it can empower the children in this sense. Um, what we're eventually hoping to do is put together portfolios of all the children. Right now all we have is a Facebook page um, and we're working on a website and so eventually we'll have portfolios of the children, their background. The boy at the beginning, um, his name is Shuban, um, he comes from a broken foam, home, sorry. He works with his, he lives with his mother, he sells the arty. He's like the oddball because he's 15 years old and they're mostly like 10 year olds and so everybody else sort of says to him, why are you still doing this? He also doesn't know how to put the arty together, so his mother has to do it for him, which is another added sort of ridicule for the poor boy. Um, but basically, we're putting together a little bit of portfolio about their background and then the, their photographs, and then we'll utilize them and we'll sell them, hopefully, um, and raise money that we can give back to the children so that they don't have to really just sell the arty and they're doing something a little bit more productive, and it builds like a little bit more self-esteem, basically. Um, we do have postcards that we're selling. They actually do sell, <laughs> but very cheaply. So, so that's sort of basically where we are right now and sort of just the concept of using art as a form of social justice issue. So that's all I have to say. Ginny and, and uh, Jamie, that was, that was really interesting. I enjoyed both of us. Um, what I'm going to do today is just kind of give you um, some images over the past eight years. Uh, Ginny and I have been working together uh, me with the uh, visual arts side of the exhibit and her uh, with the, the trafficking and uh, conferences. And so over the years we've had many, many artists. And what I've discovered, discovered is that social justice artists and human rights artists have kind hearts and are very generous and will often donate their artwork, um, pay for the shipping, uh, you know, they're, they're just they're just unbelievable people uh, and hearts, noble hearts. And so we've, our collection has been growing. And, and actually, we didn't even start collecting the permanent exhibit until probably uh, three or four years ago. So if I had thought of this eight years ago, we would have you know the entire floor filled with, um, with artwork. And actually, this is just a selection of, of the permanent exhibit from South Texas College. So there is still quite a bit more uh, on campus that I couldn't fit in my car or I couldn't you know mail. And um, so it, it's become. Uh, a very impressive collection, I think, and, and I haven't seen too many permanent collections that focus 
on human rights art. Uh, what I'll show you today are images that are not here uh, as part of the collection because you can see all these at, at, in your own leisure. And something that's interesting about these is they all have artists' uh, statements. And what I started to do two years ago is to ask the accepted artist, it's a juried show, um, to write something about what the piece is about and also why is that important to you. As either as a person or artist, it doesn't matter, just why is it important to you. And I wish I had done that you know, years ago as well because a lot of times uh, even people that studied art might not interpret the art as the artist intended or might interpret it in a completely different way and in my opinion as an artist, that's okay. I, I do always like to see what the artist intended, but to me, uh, and again in my opinion, I think it's okay for every individual to have some sort of interpretation, a personal interpretation, uh, because we all look at art very differently. Uh, we look at it based on what we know, our experiences, what we've gone through, what culture or language we talk to. But the other thing that I've noticed about visual arts and, and all types of creative art is that it will break down barriers, uh, language barriers. You see an image and you are forced to react. It might be a good reaction, it might be a bad reaction, you might go, oh, this is horribly ugly, which is also okay in, in terms of art because uh, an artwork, a good artwork, doesn't have to be pretty, and, that, and that's a forbidden word in, in art. Uh, we, we don't like that word, but uh, beautiful is okay, it's, uh, that's accepted. Um, but even if it's repulsive, that might be what the artist wants to do because it will make you look at it. It will make you think about it. It might not make you think about it right then at that moment. That's the other interesting thing about art is that it might have a slow long-term effect. And the way I am, I usually don't react you know, right away. I, I need to go home, sleep on it, think about it. Sometimes it might take weeks or months. Uh, sometimes years later, I'll, I'll see something that reminds me of something I heard or talked about or saw and, and I'll say oh wow because you change over time and you start to reevaluate things uh, based on circumstances that change we all change in life so that's what I think is really interesting about uh, this exhibit and, and artwork focusing on human rights and social justice you might not have that effect that we all hope for you'll see this work and the world will change. It might, not, it might not happen. If it changes one person or you, or starts a conversation, that's, that's fantastic. You know? So that's, that's really the way I look at it. It's, it's one of those things, I might not see any sort of positive movement through, through this experience, but maybe five years down the, the line, I might get an email, oh, by the way, that, that, uh, that picture that I saw in your exhibit, I started thinking about that and then I had this conversation and, and you start making connections. Connections of, of people who may or may not be different or um, have things in, in common. So that's what I think is really important about this exhibit. Um, to give you some background, uh, Jenny mentioned it slightly about uh, eight years ago, we started to do a collaboration. And collaboration to me is very important. Um, I often get all my great ideas from other people. <laughs> I borrow them. Uh, so I'm not seeing it, no. But uh, collaboration to me and in art I think is very important because you, you can almost always do something better with a team or with other people uh, collaborating. So uh, that's something to me is really important and I think his art is really important. So this was the first poster and it was one of those things that happened, you know, like really quick. I didn't plan it, you know, really thoroughly because it, it was really Jenny who was saying we we're having this uh, this conference uh, about women in war. And uh, we started talking, okay, let's do an art exhibit. That's just another way of maybe uh, continuing the conversation or a different way of, of looking at certain things. Um, so we did this poster and uh, we used the, the Rosie the Riveter from uh, from like the, the 40s uh, in US culture. It was, it was uh, kind of an icon about how uh, women during that time, during the Second World War and after would uh, really made some progress as far as uh, labor issues. I, I think, you know, the, the men went off to war and then the women were there left to do a, a lot of the work that was men's work before. Uh, some of a, a very hard manual blue collar work. And so I started thinking about this, this also and, and how uh, that was really a pivotal point of time. Uh, go ahead, please. And so that was the first poster. And then after that, I started thinking, well, 
that's a, that's a really a, a small section of what we could be talking about. And then uh, the next conference was on sex trafficking. And then I just opened it up to general human rights and social justice issues, just to kind of make it uh, a more general theme, get more participation. Uh, you didn't eliminate a lot of the artist community. Um, and I think um, most artists have something that they can contribute, even if that's not the focus of their work. Artists are, are I think, genuinely concerned about a lot of issues uh, and, in general, react to things that disturb them. So if you see something disturbing, you often want to create something about it, whether it's a poetry or a song, uh, a movie, uh, a painting. A lot of times you want to react to either something you want to change or something you don't understand. And art is a way of investigating that topic uh, in a personal way and also investigating it in a long-term way that, that's public. So this was uh, the, t the 2010 uh, Best of Show piece and it was a very small intimate piece but I thought this the, the visual impact of it is, um, is, is striking. It, it starts to, to, I mean certain things start going through your mind about, about suffering, about abuses. Please. And so there's a lot of different topics. Some is about war, uh, some is about discrimination, exclusion, um, some are more disturbing than others, some are very subtle, um, and I think I have, as a juror, I have a lot of flexibility as far as what I would say is a human right or a social justice issue. I, I think if it's, it's important, I'd like to include it into the conversation, even though it may not be something as, you know, like a, a very, uh, important thing in the news or, or very current. Uh, they are contemporary artists, which I think is important as well, because contemporary meaning today are artists working in things that are happening today, even if it's on a personal um, type of reflection, but it's, it's current in some way, even in their mind or in, in the public. Uh, this was a, a merit award from a couple years ago, and uh, this really helped because she gave uh, a, um, an artist statement about it and, and she talks about being uh, a Filipino American and how she went overseas and lived in the Middle East for a while and she knew of someone who was uh, basically captured and held prisoner in the house to be a domestic servant. No pay, wouldn't, wouldn't be let out or anything like that and it disturbed her greatly so she put together uh, a painting representing uh, like the great escape. Uh, this focuses on uh, the border crossing of, of Juarez, Mexico, and El Paso. I, I'm sure a lot of you are, are aware of this, probably all of you are aware of this, um, the struggles of uh, the women who were trying to cross the border and disappeared, uh, presumably uh, murdered. Uh, they found mass graves, and this, this has happened uh, for the last decade, more or less, and I'm sure to some extent still happening. There's, there's people missing all over the world. Um, you had mentioned uh, about Canada. Um, so this uh, this basic, this is in Spanish. Uh, this is a, a curse word that is written in in slang. Um, who beep uh, cares about the women of Juarez? You know because it was often not talked about. The, the police wouldn't investigate it. Uh, there was even a, a politician I heard when he was asked, oh, you know, what's what do you think about the problems in Juarez? And and he said, well, you know. Uh, the women these days, they, they dress uh, too, too provocatively, you know, it's probably half their fault they, they had it coming. Or so. And uh, this was a politician. And you, you just think about, oh, you know, this is, this is unbelievable today, this is happening. So this is a very disturbing image. You know, you, you look at the distortion of the faces and uh, the, the, the person in the back with the, that's in disguise and with the knife. And this, this will probably haunt you for a while. This image is, is really uh, is one of those that you say, okay, it's not a pretty picture, but it's effective. Uh, this was from a uh, professor at the University of Monterrey in Mexico. Very simple. It doesn't have to be striking as far as grotesque or, or beautiful. It could be very simple. My little girl, that's what it says in, in Spanish. And it's just a lock of hair. And so you start thinking about what, what could this mean? You know, the, what, what I would think about is she's missing. You know, that's something that you would see in evidence. Um, so. It, it depends how you look at it and what you might start thinking, how you interpret the, the image. Uh, this is a really interesting piece. Um, and 
it's symbolic in a, in a way. Uh, and I'm going to refer to my notes. This was from uh, Thomas Jackson. He was in the last uh, human rights exhibit. And it's called Trust Me. And when I first saw it, I, I was going through the jury process. And I emailed him because he was so disturbing to me. And, and he's one of the, the artists who had um, exhibited throughout the years. And, and I looked at the razor. And I was wondering, what, what is he trying to say? And so I emailed him uh, before I accepted it uh, to the show. I said, what are you trying to say? Please, you know, explain to me. It's because I, I'm, I'm thinking all kinds of things. And, you know, I think, oh, maybe this guy lost his mind or something. And I don't want to put it in the show. And, you know, he was just arrested for killing somebody or something like that. You know? So, I, you know, can you explain this to me? And, and um, uh, he's, a, he's a very talented artist. And uh, he said, well, you know, with my work, I want to leave it open to interpretation. You know, I, I want it to mean what you want it to mean or how you look at it. And, you know, I, I, I like that. That's the way I, I like to present my work as well. But he said, you know, look, look at the, the object. It's symbolic. It's exaggerated in size. And it's disturbing. It's, it's a straight razor for, for shaving. So what is the piece about? Is it about shaving? I, I doubt it, you know. But then you start thinking about the title, Trust Me. And then I started thinking about how do we make judgments about who to trust? Is it based on appearance? Is it based on color? Is it based on their language? How they're dressed? You know, how can you make an informed judgment about somebody that you don't know? And then I started thinking about um, uh, trafficking issues. And, and I thought back to Mimi Chakarova's presentation many years ago. And I started thinking about how she was saying, often uh, when someone is trafficked, they are approached by somebody, uh, usually a, a female, that seems, you know, pretty legitimate, you're offering you a job or, or, or so, some opportunity. It's, it's not who you would think, in, in, you know, on the movies would be a, a criminal or something. And you think, how do you make that judgment who to trust or not? And then I started thinking, you know, I've been to a barber and I've had that sort of trust issue with, you know, oh, this guy has my knife, you know. And, uh, and it actually crossed my mind at the, at, the, at the time. And I haven't been back to the barber after that. <laughs> I've stopped shaving, as you can see. Um, so, and, and when he was going like this, I was like, God, I don't know this guy. You know, maybe, maybe he just, uh, you know, had a bad day and uh, who knows. And so I, I started thinking about that and making those kind of relationships. Uh, this is from a uh, University of Pan American, uh, University of Texas Pan American professor, a uh, Hispanic um, gentleman that submits every year as well. And, and he f is focusing here on home. You're looking at the trunk of a car and, and the issues of homelessness. Um, and I've always thought how easily it would be for any of us to make one bad decision. And you might end up without a job. You might end up homeless. You might end up dead or crippled. One bad decision, or in jail. One bad decision, um, and it changes your life, you know. And, and so it's, it's really easy to judge somebody, ah, he's homeless, you know, he's lazy, he's not working or, or whatever. And so you started thinking about, you know, how many times in my life I've been really close to making a bad decision that could have changed my life dramatically. Uh, Michelle, please. And, uh, and actually, Paul Vadas is the, the one here. And, and he's uh, uh, talking about uh, kind of labor issues uh, with this one. But this one over here is talking about homelessness as, as well. You know, you're living in a, in a car. Um, could be you have a family. It could be that you had a career uh, and just something went wrong. Uh, you could be, you know, Christian, Muslim, whatever religion. It, it doesn't matter. Homelessness and poverty often doesn't discriminate. You know, so it, it could happen to any of us. Uh, this one is about labor also, and actually my personal work right now is focusing on labor, so I'm, I'm really interested in uh, in labeling of types of work and the value of types of work, or not necessarily the value, but how we place value on that work, whether it's domestic labor, is that any better or worse than being a college professor, or being a lawyer, or, or a judge, or you know, being a housewife, or a single father, and, and just labeling issues. And so often, I, I think in, in our society, we often put labels on domestic servants or farmers or someone uh, who might not have a high paying job, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a fulfilling job. And I've often seen people who are much happier than a lot of people who have wealth 
wealth of money or uh, an important title, and they're just working in the field or cleaning houses or, or doing something that they want to do, and they have a rich, full life. You know, the, I mean, the, the only thing they have to worry about is having enough to eat and having shelter, which obviously is a concern, but just happy people and fulfilled lives. So I started kind of examining, uh, examining that aspect of it, please. This one, when I first saw it, I thought it was about access to dental care. And, you know, I was thinking, and I have a thing with teeth, you know, and I'm always flossing and brushing my teeth. And, and so I think, I, I just looked at this and said, oh my God, I got to go to the dentist and get a, a cleaning. And, and, but it wasn't, you know, but that's okay because I can interpret different than, than what the artist uh, intended. So I was thinking, you know, access to medical care. Um, and there was a time uh, that I was in Texas that I was working like three part-time jobs and no insurance, no medical insurance because I was making enough through those three part-time jobs to have more than what is allowed for government help, but I didn't have enough to actually pay for dental work. So I had to take a bus to Mexico, it was about a 10 hour bus ride, and uh, whereas, you know, 10 times cheaper th for dental care. And so I took the bus, I took a couple of days off work, took the bus, got my teeth fixed, you know, like everything, there was three things wrong, and took the bus back. And, um, and I was thinking, you know, God, you know, I, I really wish I had dental insurance. Uh, and so this really had an impact on me. But this one, uh, in the artist statement, is about uh, the concept of silence. Silencing the voice, silencing a person, whether it's actually physically silencing the person or through fear and intimidation, silencing the person. So I found this really interesting after I read the, and I think both interpretations are good. <laughs> Uh, this one was in last uh, year's exhibit as well, and uh, um, it's called No Blood for Money. Uh, this artist uh, exhibits every year, and, and she's a fabulous artist, and, and this was a reflection of a trip that she made to Haiti and a newspaper article that came out in the New York Times about that uh, period, I think it was 2012. And it was about a, uh, a young mother who gave birth to a child, and um, she everything was fine, the child came out okay, uh, healthy, uh, but she started to, to bleed. And she, was, she explained in an artist statement that in Haiti, you have to bring everything to the hospital before you have any kind of surgery or any kind of pro you can plan on getting sick or something if that happens. Uh, but she didn't bring blood with her. Uh, you have to bring, you know, the, all the, the medicines, your sheets, uh, the syringes. But she didn't have, she didn't anticipate to have a problem bleeding. And so she died because she didn't have money to buy blood or she didn't bring the blood with her. Um, so this, this one was, was really disturbing to me, but the artist statement is even more disturbing. Um, this one I, I, I really like also, and over the years it has come different meanings to me and it, and it keeps kind of changing, um, but what strikes me is uh, the lady using the bottled water to bathe, and you know, which is gluttonous, I don't know if that's a, a, I mean, certainly a, a sin in some religions, but uh, I don't know if it's a human right to not be allowed to be uh, gluttonous, but, uh, but it, I keep looking at it and I'm coming up with different interpretations. So, so that disturbed me that, you know, wasting water obviously is, is, is not good, but just the happiness on her face, it's like, yeah, you know, it was like, it's like throwing in your face, I have money, I'm wealthy, I'm, you know, using bottled water to bathe with. And then I started looking at uh, the, the figure down here. And I'm not sure if uh, she's vacuuming, cleaning, or working in the field, but it's a person of color um, compared to the, the blonde haired lady. And, and then I start looking at, you know, there's an atomic uh, symbol here, and I'm looking at the water, and, and I'm thinking there's a lot of different things happening there. And this was before I, I required the artist statement, so you're going to have to trust me on my interpretation, but it'll, it'll have to, um, you know, your personal interpretation. Uh, could be totally different, but I, I just keep looking at this, and it's a beautiful picture as far as like the colors. And so you look at it, and you first look at it, and you're like happy, yeah, you know, she's all happy. And then you start looking at little disturbing things in it. So I, I think it's one of those things that over the years develops. Uh, this one again, disturbing, uh, and it's, it's talking about um, uh, politics. You have all these starving, suffering skeletons in a in a row walking down a path, and then you have two fat politicians, one with a cognac, the other with a cigar, and then uh, the gun barrel facing down. So a lot of different uh, 
powerful messages with, within that as well. Uh, this one I like also because we're right on the border wall. Uh, McAllen, Texas is right next to Mexico, and so we had the border wall uh, right through uh, 10 minutes away from, from our campus, basically. And, and then I, I started, and it's very simple, and I started looking at this, and it uses text, uh, good fences make, and, and it stops. And then when I first saw that, I, I thought of the old American saying, uh, I think it was from the 50s, good fences make good neighbors, neighbors exactly, <laughs> yeah. And my, my family is kind of like that too. It, it's, and Texas, forget about it. It's, it's very, you know, you fence off everything and don't cross the property line. You know, some people I've seen, you know, signs, uh, no trespassing, we have guns, you know, things like that. Uh, other signs that uh, in stores, they have signs that say, we won't call the police. In inviting you, try to rob us if you can. We won't, we have guns, we won't call the police. You know, almost challenging. So I, I look at it and you're like, going, what? Where are you from? You know. <laughs> so I, I look at this and then I think about the border wall and what the border wall means. Uh, not only physically, it's it's a border. It's keeping you out, us in. It's separating us. But mentally, it's it's also saying, you know, we're better than you. I I think that's the way I look at it. You know, you, you're not allowed here because we're better than you in a, in a way. The, the history of fences, you know, whether it's the cattle range, you know, just crossing, uh, separating borders, um, dividing languages, dividing cultures. Um, it, fences are, are interesting, to say the least, but I, I don't know if they're a positive thing in any way, with, with the exception if you have, like, a dog you want to keep in the, in the house or something like that. I don't know. The dog might not be willing to do that as well, you know, please. And this is the actual physical border wall. This is a photographer from uh, uh, the neighboring university. And so you can see how uh, militarized it, it is. I mean, uh, you, you have uh, this road, uh, this surveillance everywhere. You have this physical structure that is really intimidating. Then you have uh, the border patrol. Uh, I, I don't have an answer to any of these. And I think a lot of us as artists, we don't often offer answers. And I would like to offer answers, but I feel that questioning often has the effect of a group collaboration. So many artists will not have the answer to certain things, but we have a lot of questions. And I think that's uh, one way to start a conversation. And so unfortunately, I don't have answers to a lot of things. <laughs> uh, one more. Um, this one is, is really interesting also. This is a, a, a friend of mine from Texas Tech University, uh, and he'll be coming in October for more talks and an exhibit here in October. And he deals with uh, gender issues, uh, labeling. He is uh, a gay man that is an educator and an artist. And his artist statement about this um, talks about his struggles in the 80s and early 90s as a gay educator. Uh, Texas, like I said, is, is pretty conservative for the most part. And um, he has like personal issues about uh, being labeled a certain way. And also, uh, he said in his statement about if he came out in the 80s as being a gay man, how that would just destroy his teaching career and, and relationships as, as well. So this was really a clever, clever uh, arrangement is a, a photograph of two Ken dolls hiding in the bushes. In, it's actually in his backyard. And it's very subtle. And, and he said in his statement how he used toys to, in a way, disarm some of that prejudice and hate and, and ignorance that some people might have towards him or towards, uh, towards gay men or, or towards just anybody that's different. And it is very clever using toys because you, you look at toys and you don't feel threatened. You know, so th I, I thought that was just a really clever um, photograph. And, and, and I hope you guys are here in, in October. I'm sure he could explain it much better than me. So that's the, uh, the end of uh, my presentation. This is just